Hello, I'm Paul Beckwith. I'm with the University of Ottawa Laboratory for Paleoclimatology and also with Carleton University Department of Geography and Environmental Studies. So I'm continuing my discussion of methane here. So basically we, these gas hydrates, the stability depends on the pressure temperature conditions. So the relatively shallow depths of hydrate occurrence both beneath the seafloor and in permafrost areas relative to that of conventional natural gas, which is a lot deeper. Um, the hydrate concentrates the gases. Um, one cubic meter of the hydrate can contain 180 cubic meters of methane. So when the stuff melts, you get this expansion of 180 times, the large amount of carbon trapped in globally in the hydrate. So there's this perception that the breakdown or dissociation is a huge threat from global warming slash climate change. Um, so also this, if a large amount was released, it would be a very, very powerful feedback for climate change. So we really need to get a handle on the actual risks of this stuff coming up, um, whether it's a large risk, whether it's a small risk. So. Basically, this paper, it talks about, it says, it, this has led some to adapt a catastrophic perspective on the interaction of the climate system with the global gas hydrate reservoir. And it lists, you know, authors from 2008, 9, 1990, 2009, and this is the Whiteman et al. 2013 paper is the Whiteman Wadhams paper talking about a 50 gigaton um, catastrophic release. So this paper is looking at the current state of knowledge on the interactions between these hydrates and the climate system. And it's saying this paper is basically coming to the conclusion, rightly or wrongly, that this runaway dissociation of methane um, is low risk, not high risk. Okay. Um, so there's also, there's been lots of studies about past events. The Paleocene-Eocene thermal maximum 55.5 million years ago when there was a warming about five degrees Celsius, um, but that was over, you know, fairly long time period on human time scales. Um, and so the fate of the, these methane hydrates under past scenarios can hopefully give us insight into the potential for, for large releases of the methane hydrates under present and future climate change scenarios. But lots of these studies did not include factors like sinks that strongly mitigate the impact that hydrate-derived methane has on the ocean atmosphere system. Okay, that's the argument here. So the paper, you know, this review paper looks at all the background information um, and then tries to make an assessment of, uh, you know, considering, considers the sources and the sinks of the methane, how it reacts in the physical um, atmosphere ocean system and uh, the impact that it can have on um, raising temperature is a strong feedback. Okay, so first of all, you know, the obvious question is, is, um, you know, where do these gas hydrates occur? What is the size of the potential methane source associated with them? And how does that fit into the overall global climate, uh, global carbon cycle? Um, there's not a lot known about Antarctica, so there's not a lot of information about, about that. One thing that's very interesting is the methane that is trapped underneath the actual ice caps, both on Greenland and Antarctica. So we, if, if we get very rapid um, loss of ice over Greenland, then there can be significant methane release from underneath that ice. So basically, about 99% of the gas hydrates form in marine sediments. They're on continental slopes at water depths of greater than about 500 meters at temperate latitudes, low latitudes, 300 meters at high latitudes where the water's colder. Um, okay, so this sets the pressure temperature limit, which sets up a gas hydrate stability zone. 
um, and um, but you still need to have a methane source. So because you have a gas hydrate stability zone, it doesn't necessarily, it's not necessarily occupied by methane hydrates. And this is a very important distinction which was overlooked in the original papers that came up with that 11,000 gigatons of carbon estimate, for example. On the ocean floor, on the abyssal plains, there is very little gas hydrate, although there is some if the methane can seep through the sediments but it's not a significant amount. Um, organic carbon goes down into the sediments by the rain of phytoplankton to the seafloor in productive regions. The export of terrestrial sediments containing carbon, so that material goes to the seafloor and it can be broken down by microbes uh, to produce um, CO2 and methane. So this is microbial methane. When we talk about thermogenic methane, this is methane that is um, accessed by fracking. This is methane that is much deeper down, formed at high temperatures by the same processes that bake um, organic material to produce coal and oil and, you know, this is natural gas. And a lot of it actually is found in, in oil that is recovered also. Okay, so if we look at the vertical distribution of the hydrates, um, the, as I say, and this paper is saying, the, you need to distinguish between the gas hydrate stability zone and the zone where there's actually gas hydrate occurring. Okay, because then we need to talk about things like the nature of the sediments, the pore size. If it's mostly sand, there's lots of space between the sand particles. There's lots of gaps where the methane uh, hydrates can be. If it's um, silts, so smaller particles, there's less available pore space. If it's um, even really, really fine clay, um, much, very, much, very, very small particles, there's even less pore space. So <coughs> we also need to talk about the base of the gas hydrate stability. Um, so there has to also be enough gas, methane, available in excess of the local solubility. So the stuff in excess of that solubility then comes out and forms these hydrates over long periods of time. Um, and there, there's also um, biochemistry going on. So if there's sulfur present, then there's reduction. So above the hydrate zone, there can be sulfur and the methane is consumed by microbial processes um, in the presence of this sulfur. Um, and so unless there's high flux, unless there's large amounts of methane coming up, then large quantities of the methane that is trickling up is captured by, this, uh, by these other processes in the sediments. And this is called um, um, anoxic, um, th this is an anoxic process in the absence of oxygen which um, AOM, anoxic oxidation of methane. So this is happening in the, in the sediments. So again, um, you know, the, the type of material, whether it's clays, which are very fine grained, or, um, or coarse grained sediments like sand, there's high permeability, so, so things can move in between the grains, whereas if the fine, with the fine grained sediments, um, that's not happening. Okay, so um, we just expanded the screen. How do we go back? I don't know. Touch screen. Um, okay, so so that's about ninety nine percent of the um, ninety nine percent, and the the other one percent is in northern latitude, high northern latitude permafrost areas. Um, both onshore, be beneath the tundra, and on continental shelves or in the margins where sea level has been, you know, th at the end of the last ice age, when the ice was melting, sea level was rising since about 15,000 years ago. And, um, okay, so, so these, um, so the methane is in those different places. Okay, so let me uh, see if I can reduce the screen size here. Here we go.
something back to more reasonable. Okay, so, <coughs> so this is a distribution of the hydrate, and now we're talking about the, the amount of methane. Okay, so, so the global estimate of methane, um, like I said, has been, you know, originally it was very high, um, the amount of methane in uh, the methane hydrates was estimated to be 11,000 gigatons. The more recent number is about 1,800 uh, gigatons. So this is a this is a uh, you know a good thing. The numbers come down, um, and so there's uh, so here's the value here. 1,800 gigatons um, is the estimate you know based on uh, you know, a lot of different papers that have come out fairly recently um, as compared to this 11,000 gigaton number which came out in the late 80s and has been criticized by all of the more recent papers. Um, okay, so um, there's also, you have to remember that it's not just the methane in the hydrates, um, you can have free gas that is below and that can be released due to perturbations in the gas hydrate stability zone and the amounts of the free gas could be as large as two-thirds of the estimated gas in place in, in the hydrates according to this. Okay, so, um, <clears throat> so now how does climate change affect it? So obviously rising temperatures can thaw out the hydrates and then the methane is released but you can't uh, you have to look carefully at what happens to the methane after that case. So global warming raises the ocean and air temperatures, but it also increases the sea level, which increases the pressure on the hydrate. So, um, so in, in this case, um, you know, every, not, ev not everything is working toward, towards exposing the hydrates. Okay, the high temperature pressure would expose them, cause uh, releases to be larger, but the higher sea level goes in the opposite direction. Um, so, unless of course the, you have the hydrates that are stored under um, ice caps, for example, the ice mass on Greenland is pushing down the bedrock, depressing the bedrock, increasing the pressure, and if there's lots of methane hydrates underneath that ice, then as that ice rapidly melts, relieving the pressure, um, and you have lots of meltwater running underneath the ice, and it carries these hydrates or, or water that's laden with dissolved methane now that's put there from the release of the hydrates, then, then as we lose, uh, then this can greatly increase the amount of methane going into the climate system. Um, so, so, so that's talking about here. So this is not widespread on present day Earth compared to the past. You know, think of when the Laurentian ice sheet was covering most of Canada, lots of the US down to about St. Louis. So under this massive ice cap, there could have been lots of these methane hydrates. And as this ice cap melted back at the end of the last ice age, these hydrates could have been would have been released if they were there, and they could have greatly contributed to the rapid melt rate of the ice caps. Also, with the European and the the Asian, um, the Eurasia ice cap. But you know, right now it's just the the ice caps are over Greenland, they're over Antarctica. Um, they were there before. You know, there there was a lot more over Greenland, and Antarctica during the last glacial maximum about twenty one thousand years ago at the coldest period but those ice caps are still there, so we would require significantly more melt of them in order to have you know, large uh, releases of methane that's underneath those ice caps. So, so let's look at the, um, some of the other things. We can look at the, so, the, so this paper also talks about the global methane budget you know, and some of the processes with the dissociation. So how do we calculate the budgets? Well, there's always two ways of looking at a budget. You can look at it at the top-down or the bottom-up approach. Um, so I'll discuss those.